the nation's capital, the Conservative Caucus presents Conservative Roundtable, an in-depth look at today's most important issues. Welcome to Conservative Roundtable. I'm Howard Phillips, chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors these broadcasts. Our special guest today is my friend Terry Jeffrey, who's the editor-in-chief of CNS News, Cybercast News Service. Tell me what Cybercast News Service is. Cybercast News Service, Howard, is an online news agency. It was founded by Brent Bozell, who, of course, also founded the Media Research Center. It's uh, part of the Media Research Center, in fact. And what we try and do is we get, try and report uh, what's going on, especially in Washington, D.C., especially involving the federal government, and especially those things that the liberal media doesn't want to report or misreports or doesn't report as extensively enough about. We also try and, um, since we have opportunity to get into places like the White House and into the Capitol, ask hard-hitting questions of, of uh, people in public office that the liberal press isn't asking. Give me a couple of examples. Well, uh, during the, the uh, long debate over Obamacare, a major question in the minds of a lot of people, especially those who are following it closely, was where did Congress get the constitutional authority that it was contemplating exercising at forcing individuals to purchase health insurance? Because in the history of our country, never before had the federal government ever ordered individuals to buy any good or service. So we put together a very simple question, which was, where specifically does the U.S. Constitution authorize Congress to force people to buy health insurance? And reporters from CNSNews.com went over to the Capitol, oftentimes with, sometimes with video cameras, oftentimes with uh, uh, audio recording equipment, and simply asked that question. We asked Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, Matt Cover, our reporter, did, and she said, are you serious? <laughs> are you serious? And that's on videotape on our website. I that. Wants, or audio tape. That got me. a lot of play. It did get a lot of play. Uh, it's, it, it, uh, that, that answer from her resonated all across the country, in fact. And her press spokesman told Matt Cover after she said it, that's on the record. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't think it was anything else. But, uh, Patrick Leahy, the uh, uh, chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, who theoretically ought to know more about the Constitution than anybody in the United States Congress, said... Who says we don't have authority? <laughs> so you, there was quite uh, arrogant responses from some members of Congress when they asked that very simple question. Now, you are someone who relies heavily uh, on the Internet for news and information. You were formerly, I guess, head of the editorial staff of the Washington Times. I was an editorial page uh, writer at the Washington okay. Times. My boss was Tony Snow, as a matter of fact. Uh -huh. yeah. And um, do you think the print media will survive? Well, this is, we were talking about this before. I, I sure hope so. I'm not convinced, I hate to say. Um, first, the, the reason I hope so is I was someone who came to the Washington Times, someone who had uh, for a number of years tried to get a job in journalism and didn't. Until you were five. a Princeton grad. You should not have had much trouble. Well, that's true. I, had a degree in, I have a degree in English literature from Princeton University, and I went home to California, to San Francisco Bay Area where I grew up, and tried to get a job in journalism. Didn't have much luck. Uh, but a number of years later, um, after doing some graduate school, the Washington Times did give me an opportunity to be an editorial writer on their editorial page. And I learned journalism there as a journalist. And Tony Snow was one of my mentors. Arno de Borgrov, who was an editor-in-chief at the Boy, time. He writes some of the best stuff out there. He uh, does. His analysis of various aspects of foreign policy are unique fabulous, informative, and entertaining. Well, Arno Dvorgrov is one of the great journalists of all yeah. time. I mean, this, this, his, what, he did, what he has done in his career is remarkable. What, what would they call and him, the short count? He, he, he's, 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 he's quite a man. And yes, he's originally he's from Belgium. Uh, uh, and he was a count. Yes, an immigrant to the United States. But he, uh, he was the chief of correspondence for Newsweek for a time and just did some when amazing Newsweek things. Newsweek was worth reading. Did some, just did some amazing things, Howard, in his career as a journalist. And I had the privilege of working under him. He's a wonderful Smith, man. And learned a lot about journalism from him and Tony and others. Mary Lou Forbes at the Washington Times, who's a Pulitzer Prize winner. She, she won the Pulitzer Prize for covering uh, uh, the integration of the schools here in the state of Virginia. But so I know from firsthand experience that people learn the craft and profession of journalism from practicing it. They learn it from other journalists on a day-to-day -day basis. You have to do it. And I, I had the good fortune of doing that in, in a newspaper. 
And uh, I, I believe if, if those print newspapers go away and the economic model that historically has sustained print newspapers in the United States, it's, it's going to be difficult to train young people in the profession of journalism. And uh, as you and I know, there's very few opportunities already for conservatives to go through that training and have that experience. Um, America needs journalists. It needs well-trained journalists. Historically, the newspaper industry has been the place where they were produced, although unfortunately predominantly liberal. If it goes away, I think it's unclear what, whether the Internet can actually take over that role. I believe in apprenticeship as a principle for many uh, kinds of uh, work. And uh, you're underscoring the importance of apprenticeship in preparing journalists uh, to, to play a role. Uh, and, of course, on television, you have some real losers in positions of responsibility. Uh, you've got now the former governor of New York, uh, client number nine, or whatever his name is, Elliot Spitzer, uh, expounding on his opinions on television. You've got uh, Katie Couric. You've got all kinds of losers right. uh, who are in positions to shape public opinion. And then on MSNBC, wow, you, you've got uh, Keith Oberman, uh, who, if ever there was a, a loudmouth, uh, he qualifies. You've got Rachel Maddow. Uh, and uh, print media can manifest various kinds of biases. But uh, you can check it. You can look at it. And, uh, and it, it doesn't uh, remain unrebutted. But on television, you simply cannot keep under control the biases that are set forth by people in key positions. Right. And there's, there's also a heavy, uh, there's a bias towards opinion. Yeah. Journalism. I mean, all, most of those folks you mentioned, I guess with the exception of Katie Couric, really are in the business of expressing their opinions on television. Much of the news that actually is um, broadcast on television has come out of print publications you know, in the first place. They read the Washington Post, the New York Times, and then they get their lead. Right, and then they just sort of shorten it up. And, they're, and you know, when you, if you actually take the typical television news broadcast and you transcribe it and put it on a page, you, is that really all there yeah. is? Yeah. Because there's, there's often not a lot to it. And, yeah. uh, and so that's, you know, one of the reasons I'd be worried if, if newspapers go away in this country. Yeah. And then uh, you have people who uh, have a certain type of experience which can't really be well translated into the spoken word. You have this gal who is now running what used to be called uh, This Week that had uh, David Brinkley on it and it had George Stephanopoulos. And uh, her expertise is in the area of uh, foreign policy. And uh, she has turned what was once a pretty good show into the most boring program on television because they have to cover politics, and she knows zero zippo about politics. Yeah, and you know, I would say this, Howard. The, the television, the Sunday morning shows especially, missed Tim Russert. Tim Russert was an outstanding journalist. He, he in fact, was some, you know, he's someone who came out of liberal politics, quite frankly. Yeah. He, liberal he worked politics. for Tip O'Neill yes. and uh, others. But, but, he, but he was an outstanding professional journalist. He understood what he was doing. He did his homework. He understood how to craft a very uh, intelligent, factually found it question that got to the core issue in what happened to be debated at that moment that was important for a show to deal with. And uh, really, I don't see anybody of his equal uh, doing that kind of program on television at this point. Of the Sunday shows, I think uh, Chris Wallace has the best. Right. He, he is usually very well prepared. Right. And uh, his program, even without the panel, uh, is quite good. His his questioning of his guests is uh, very sharp. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and by the way, I don't want to mean to say that there aren't others out there who do. Yeah. John King on CNN is an yeah. excellent. Chris Wallace, but Tim Russert, I think, really yeah. was a model and did an outstanding job. And he especially did an outstanding job when we got into campaigns. Uh, he would be missed in this period in the presidential campaign. Uh, he he was very good at asking probing and important questions. We'll see whether we have anybody who's doing that on national network television, on national network television in, uh, in the coming cycle. Well, because uh, broadcast of, of this program we're now taping uh, will uh, occur uh, after the November 2 elections of uh, 2010, let's jump forward to 2012 and get your opinion. First of all, do you think Barack Obama will seek re-election? Yes. 
You do. Sure. Even if he's in the pits, the polls. Sure. You do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, Lyndon Johnson didn't seek re-election. He had uh, horrendous things were happening in the Vietnam War at the time. And uh, I think that was a particularly unique historical moment. He almost did it anyway. Yeah. Uh, he was going to be challenged within his own party. Uh, Barack Obama may have a challenge within his own party. I don't see one, a formidable one, emerging. And uh, You think so, Hillary is too smart to do it? Yes, I think, you know, Hillary might look at Ted Kennedy's experience in 1980. I, I think against she, Jimmy Carter. Right. I, th I think Hillary might be a more formidable candidate against Obama than Ted Kennedy was against Jimmy Carter. Because, a, Teddy Kennedy, especially at the beginning of his career, was the dumbest politician I ever <laughs> met. Really, he was really stupid. Right. Uh, I worked for Congressman Lawrence Curtis, who ran for the U.S. Senate in 1962, lost the Republican nomination to George Cabot Lodge. And on the Democratic side, it was Eddie McCormick versus Ted Kennedy. I was in the studio for those debates. And uh, I said, this guy is as dumb as a door when it came to Ted Kennedy. He, uh, he was inarticulate. He lacked knowledge. He, and I had a friend who was his roommate in college. And, of course, he was always arrested for drunk driving or cheating or something. However, he was smart enough to hire talented people, mm -hmm. and he looked less dumb as his career it, went it, you know, to, to, you know, If you step back and be objective, I disagree with just about everything Ted Kennedy ever yeah. stood for. He, people would make the point, his defenders will make the point, and I think there's a certain accuracy to it, that he's an effective legislator, unfortunately. Yeah. Hillary Clinton, on the other hand, is a very articulate, very intelligent person. I think she'd be a formidable candidate, wrong on almost all the issues, yeah. we, but we, she'd be a formidable candidate. We have candidate. to take a break. Do you know that I met... Hillary, when she was a Goldwater girl <laughs> at Wellesley College, I ran the New England Model Republican uh, nominating convention, and she had a big Goldwater button on, and she was a leader of the Goldwater forces. And she Wellesley. went wrong after that. Somewhere she went wrong. Stay with us. We'll be right back with more of the Inside Story. You are a defender of liberty. You spoke out. You were heard in Congress. No. You marched. You created a new movement. You endured attacks. You see folks waving tea bags around. Now you can help to repeal the bill. Go to sendthemamessage.com. Print the pledge to repeal Obamacare. Send it to your representative, senators, and candidates to sign that they pledge to repeal the bill. 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 Now. Go to sendthemamessage.com and help repeal the bill welcome back to conservative roundtable I'm Howard Phillips chairman of the conservative caucus which sponsors roundtable and our guest is the outstanding journalist associated with uh, CNS associated with human events, uh, a uh, widely read columnist, and uh, a man who's extremely knowledgeable. Well, we don't really, we're really not in a position to make predictions on what happens this year because the show will be broadcast after the election is over. But what do you think will happen in 2012? I gather from your previous remark, you think Obama will run for election. Right. And you think he'll probably be the Democratic nominee. I do. Do you think he'll keep Joe Biden as his running mate? Uh, I think he probably will, yeah. You know, why, why switch mules in midstream, as the saying goes? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I don't think that, you know, I don't believe Biden actually is particularly a liability for Obama. I think he's, everybody sort of discounts. Yeah. He, he makes uh, Obama look good by comparison. <laughs> he's entertaining. Yeah. And, you know, I'll tell so one thing I'll say about Joe Biden. When, when, when I was editor of Human Events, and every week we would send reporters over to uh, Capitol Hill to ask a really tough yeah. question. We do the same thing with CNS News. Yeah. Biden was one of the guys who would answer your questions. I like him as a yeah. person. Uh, you may recall I was the only conservative who opposed Bush's appointment of Souter to the U.S. Supreme Court. I do remember. 
because I had read the record, and he had changed the policies of two hospitals in uh, New Hampshire from zero abortion to convenience abortion. In any event, uh, I testified before uh, the Judiciary Committee. I don't know if Biden was the chairman, but in any event, he was in the chair when I testified, and uh, no one could have been more courteous uh, in welcoming me, welcoming me to the hearing and uh, in letting me have my say. Uh, the guy who, uh, who was tough, and I think I got the better of him, was Arlen Specter, who was uh, on the wrong side of every judicial issue. Now, there was almost no significant opposition to uh, President Obama's uh, two Supreme Court nominees, Sotomayor and Kagan. Can anything be done to rival the kind of momentum that came against or to match the kind of momentum that came against Bork when uh, when Reagan appointed him to the court. Well, you know, you've been watching this. You know this better than anyone else, Howard. Back then, you know, we had Ruth Bader Ginsburg had exactly three Republicans who and, voted. And against the guy her. who put her on the court was Orrin Hatch. Yeah. Who wiped out all the Republican opposition? Well, in fact, the very day that Bill Clinton said he was nominating Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Bob Dole and Orrin Hatch came out and said, "This is it. This is a good nominee." The three who voted against her were Bob Smith. Uh, Jesse Helms and Senator Nichols of Oklahoma, they're, no, long, the they're no longer on the scene. But if you have a re Republican insurgents in the Senate who are ready to go to war against a, a Democratic nominee for whatever Senate confirmation, or, if, if any opinion that takes a, any position that takes Senate confirmation, you can cause some real problems. You know who's been terrific? Jim DeMint. Yes. Boy, what a great job he's done, not only in the Senate, but in recruiting and supporting insurgent candidates right. who, if elected, uh, will make a real difference in the U.S. Senate. Yeah. And we'll look to Jim DeMint for leadership. But, you know, so whereas the Democrats will actually filibuster and stop Republican yeah. judicial nominees, yeah. Republicans, for the most part, historically, haven't even voted against That's these right. nominees. Even when you absolutely knew, like with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she had argued that there's a 14th Amendment equal protection right to abortion, which meant there could be absolutely no restrictions on abortion. She thought that Roe v. Wade was too moderate and conservative yeah. in opinion. Speaking of the 14th Amendment, do you think that it justifies our policy of granting citizenship to anchor babies? Well, you know, I, I, that is a question I, I, I need to really go study I don't think it does. It. I don't okay. think it does. Because they're, the, the parents and the child aren't really under the authority of the United States. They do not have loyalty. They're not under the jurisdiction. Under the jurisdiction of the United yeah. States. Yeah, I, I don't I, think you need an amendment. I think it's just a question of explaining it. Yeah, well, I, I've heard this argument, honestly, Howard. It's something that I, I would want to personally go back and look at what the debates, what the discussion were during the ratification of the 14th Amendment, which, of course, was initially and most fundamentally it had to do with about. Former slaves. Right. It's securing for the freed men who had been slaves. In, in the old Confederacy, equal rights in states where there's good reason to believe they may not get them. Well, uh, looking ahead to 2012, there have been some outstanding Republican governors emerging on the scene. Chris Christie in New Jersey is widely discussed as a potential presidential candidate. He has been simple, straightforward, straightforward in what he's had to say. He's been gutsy in not raising taxes, in cutting spending. Mitch Daniels in Indiana is getting a lot of play. They're talking about Tim Pawlenty. Uh, and, uh, of course, Haley Barber, as head of the Governor's Association, has raised a fortune to elect uh, Republican gubernatorial candidates. Do you think, and, and uh, historically, governors tend to do better than senators when a nomination is at stake? Governor Reagan, Governor Bush, et cetera. Right. Uh, what are your thoughts about what is likely to happen on the Republican side in 2012? You know, I have to say, I really don't know. For me, it's too early. I think it's possible that there could be a candidate none of us are thinking about that could emerge. As what about a, General Petraeus, who's a registered Republican? Well, you know, if you'd asked me that before President Obama stuck him in Afghanistan, I would have said absolutely. And it did look like, you know, if you, if you watch things carefully, there were subtle signals out there that maybe General Petraeus was interested in running for president. And uh, even though he's a general and he's nonpartisan and nonpolitical, I think there were some signals that this guy was a conservative, uh, political conservative. I, I don't think you can tell from a general's military record where he stands on issues. But uh, there were some signals in that direction. But being where he is in Afghanistan, given the situation in Afghanistan, I can't see this guy cutting and running from that assignment. Yeah. And 
I, so I don't see it with Petraeus at this point. You know, one of my big disappointments is that uh, Mark Sanford's possibility as a nominee has gone up in smoke with his trip to Latin right. America. <laughs> he was a pretty darn good governor and a very good conservative. Well, I have to say, I was always skeptical about Mark Sanford's position on the right to life issue. Really? Yes. And, uh, um, you know, I, I, did not, I did not believe that he was solid on that issue. And uh, when he originally ran for Congress, he, he wasn't. And uh, so I would have had to seen a lot more from him on that issue. But as you say, I mean, he's not, I mean, he's not at all. He's out of the picture kind of, now, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Um, if you could uh, pick the nominee, who would you pick? If I could pick the nominee? Yeah, if, I, if I could name someone? Yeah. President? I mean, would it be Mike Pence? Would it be Michelle Bachman? Would it be uh, uh, Mike Barber? Mike, Mike Pence and Michelle Bachman are both excellent candidates. I mean, they, they, I, I think that those are two people in the United States House of Representatives that have demonstrated that they have true conservative principles, that they are fighters. Yeah. Uh, with Mike Pence, I would point out that when George W. Bush pushed the Medicare prescription drug plan, which now has, faces a greater unfunded liability of the entire Social Security program, that Mike Pence led a group of 25 right. Republican House members who fought against it, stood up against the president of his own party, and was under tremendous pressure and did not cave. I, I like Mike Pence. But like every one of us, certainly including me, he's not perfect. Uh, he supports a vote for D.C. in the House of Representatives. He's probably on the wrong side of Puerto Rican statehood, and he's on the wrong side of some immigration issues. Those are good points. His immigration plan, I think, was wrong-headed. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and I agree with you. I agree with you on those things. Michelle Bachman, also an outstanding member of the House, and uh, is a real fighter. And, uh, you know, and in she, her personal life, a fabulous person. She, she, this, this is someone the Republican Party really should have in a leadership role and ought to look to as a potential president of the United States. There's absolutely no doubt of that. Another, another person who's done some very good things in the House and it is Paul Ryan from Wisconsin, yeah. who is the leading voice for Social Security yeah. and Medicare reform. He'll be that chairman of the Budget Committee if the Republicans take the House. So he, he those are, you know, it, it, it's, it, someone coming out of the House and getting elected president is even more... Garfield did it. Yeah, and, and that was a very unusual circumstance. He had actually been elected to the Senate by the Ohio State Legislature before he got the nomination in the 1880 Republican Convention, where Ulysses S. Grant was trying to come back for a third nomination. You had an incumbent Republican president. It's a very strange situation. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, I don't, I don't see a Garfield happening in this mm -hmm. election. I don't think we want a Garfield to happen. Although but, he was a pretty good guy in many ways. But it's not impossible. His, to come... his big problem was going along with Roscoe Conkling and having yes, Chester right. Arthur as his running mate. <laughs> who was responsible for the mess of civil service. Which might have been a backroom deal. Yeah, it, which it was. It, it, it was a backroom yes, deal. Yes, it was, it was not a good thing. But uh, it's not impossible that someone could come out of the House of Representatives. Yeah. It's not impossible that a governor that's not on the radar screen yeah. now. It's not impossible that someone who's not directly in political office. I think the political environment in America now is ready for someone who people believe this person is going yeah. to bring us back to if, constitutional If ever there was a time right. for something different, it's it. We have to take a break. We'll be back with some concluding comments from our special guest, Terry Jeffrey. Hey, listen. This is the greatest thing. I want to tell you something. Something's happening in this country. And I want to tell you, look, at, look around my friends here. My friends here in Washington, come over here. See all these great people? <laughs> these great folks are here because they want to take the country back to the direction of the Founding Fathers and stop all this nonsense that's going on and stop this, uh, you know, this uh, immersion into socialism which is happening. We've got to stop it. And every day we're losing a little bit of our freedom. But the, the answer is that the, that the individual citizens can make a difference. They can walk through these houses of Congress. They can look, at, look their congressmen in the eye and say, hey, vote this bill down. Get rid of it. We got a lot of work to do. And the, the first thing we have to do is get rid of the garbage and the attacks on our freedoms. This is it. So anyway, that's what these guys are doing here today to do. Yes. And, uh, and I say, all of you guys out there, where it was the sound of my voice and the, and the, you know, the visual that, you're cre that this great gentleman has created, get down here and do your, do your uh, responsible citizenship by going and seeing your representatives and telling them 
you know, what you want because this is this is your house. It's not their house. Yeah. Get in there and tell them what to do, and let's uh, let's begin cleaning this country up. Is a, a big yes. mess has been created in only a year's time, in nine months' time, really. A big mess we have to recover from. We got to start work. We got to throw some people out. So anyway, I love this country. I love you. Go do your job. Thank you. Welcome back. If you're interested in the kinds of issues we discuss on Conservative Roundtable, check out our website for the Conservative Caucus, www.conservativeusa.org. Uh, take down our fax number, 703-281-4108. Send us your name and address. Without cost or obligation, we'll send you information. We'd like to get you involved. Terry, it's been wonderful having you as a guest. And on the screen, there's contact information for, uh, for Terry Jeffrey. What are your parting thoughts? Well, Howard, I just say, I want to say, when I was working in my most recent book, Control Freaks, which came out at the end of July, I did a little research about what happened in America after the original Boston Tea Party in December of 1773. The British closed down the port of Boston. The Committee of Correspondence in Boston wrote a letter to the people in Philadelphia and New York that Paul Revere literally wrote down to folks there, asking them to join in a boycott of British goods. And when they, they got it in Philadelphia, they didn't call their assembly. They called a convention of delegates from the counties to a grassroots meeting in Philadelphia. One of the people there was John Dickinson, who wrote the letters from a Pennsylvania farmer, a very smart lawyer. Started a law school. And he was commissioned by them, by that grassroots group of people, to write instructions to the Pennsylvania Assembly. They ended up sending Pennsylvania to the Continental Convention. In his instructions, he said that humanity and justice demanded that that generation of Americans who had enjoyed freedom needed to preserve it for their children and posterity, and that already the British were started on a course that would take our freedom away. We always had to fight to keep it. Thank you. It's Terry. like 1774 again. Thank you.